Hi, everyone. I'm Connie Zabo Schmucker, Advocacy Director at Bicycle Garage Indy, and this is a Bicycling Lunch and Learn for April 2024. We're going to learn about um, tips for camping on your own. And when we get to the presentation, um, Anthony and Damon will um, give all sorts of tips about their different experiences doing that. Um, but first, I uh, want to let folks know that this this is being recorded so that you can view it later, um, as well as, you know, other people can view it if they can't attend. Uh, this program is presented by the Cycle Commuter Task Force, which is a collaborative effort of Bike Indianapolis, Bicycle Garage Indy, Commuter Connect, and Central Indiana Bicycling Association. So um, there's a lot of events that are happening in the next month or so. So I'm going to let Tess go ahead and talk about some of the things that Bike Indianapolis has going on. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we have going on, and then we'll get to the presentation. So Tess, go ahead and uh, talk about what's coming on. Hi, I'm Tess Woods. I'm with Bike Indianapolis. And yes, uh, so May is Bike Month, so we want to highlight some of the things that are coming up. Lots of fun events and opportunities to ride. Um, the Cycle Commuter Task Force um, has the Ride to the Polls, which is May 4th from 11 to 2. Um, and that is early voting. And um, we'll have bike racks there, so you can park while you go vote um, at Luger Plaza. So mark your calendars for that one. Um, we also have Bike to Work Day, which is on Friday, May 17th from 7 to 9 a.m., once again at Luger Plaza. And we will have free breakfast by Bearded Bagel and free coffee from Tinker and a short program. So, And we also have bike trains that are coming from various um, outlying areas down to Luger Plaza. So um, put that on your calendar as well. And then finally, um, our big one, uh, it's a fundraiser for Bike Indianapolis, is Bike to the 500, uh, which is obviously on Sunday, May 26th. We have two rides that are being police escorted to the track from the AMP, one at 7.30 and one at 9.30. Um, so it's a probably the best and fastest and most fun way to get to the race. So um, if you can join us for that, um, you'll have a great time. Awesome. So a um, couple of other things that are coming up, Bicycle Garage Indy uh, is going to have our some rides, mountain bike rides and road bike rides starting up in May. Um, we've started doing some fixed flat, clinic, flat fix clinics at our locations, and they're like on the third Wednesday and third Thursday, um, drop in at our north and south stores. Um, and then the downtown location is going to have a registered one. And I think the first one is May 21st. And Tony, who's our presenter today, is going to be teaching that at our downtown location. Uh, it's from six to seven. The and then on April 29th, I'm going to I'm going to be doing a presentation about finding right above routes um, using uh, various sources, but mostly ride with GPS and some other ways that you can find great places to ride and different events that you might not know about. Uh, we have our last tri clinic coming up and I think that's all I've got for right now but there's a lot of activities it's you know bike month a lot of things going on um, next month's Lunch and Learn is actually going to be about the Bike Month activities, mm -hmm. and and um, in June we're going to be doing some e-bike rider profiles. So people who use e-bikes for all sorts of reasons, we're going to be um, peppering them with questions about how they use it, and um, so that we're looking forward to that as well. So with that, I am going uh, to... Can I stick one more in? Sure. Um, May 8th is Bike to School Day. Ah, if yes. you are at all involved with the school and are interested in putting on an event that day, I'm going to drop a link in the chat on a quick how to plan a bike event in seven days. I suggest you start before that with 
but it's doable. Uh, and if you need some help, get a hold of me and I'll be glad to, to participate. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so I will turn this over to Anthony um, first, and then after he is done, um, Damon will also talk about his experiences um, doing self-directed tours. And, and we're going to save questions to the end, but feel free to type them in in the chat so that we can cover them at the end. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Anthony. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the intro, Connie. It's uh, fun to hear about all the events coming up. Uh, and just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. All right. So uh, thanks, everybody, for joining today. I'm glad this is recorded. So those uh, watching it later can, can catch it, too. Feel free to share it. Um, I'll also be sending uh, these slides as a PDF to Connie uh, so that she can send it out to folks that registered uh, and it will have links in the presentation. So things that you see that are links, you'll be able to just click through to uh, later. So uh, I'm going to chat a bit about my experience uh, bike camping, bike touring. Um, I've, I've done it extensively, um, but this is more of a uh, beginners type chat uh, for those that want to try it. Uh, and there's plenty of ways to uh, get get your uh, your wheels on the road and uh, get to a camp uh, that's not too far away. So uh, don't be uh, um, uh, intimidated by, you know, multi-month bike tourists. Uh, most of the folks that do this stuff are, you know, going out for one day or a week, uh, one or two days. Uh, or one night camping, uh, not taking five months off like I did in 2022. Um, so I had a, a little bit of a midlife crisis uh, slash sabbatical. My longest bike tour was in 2022. Um, and that uh, is the, the route that you can see if you've got a screen up. Um, the uh, I started in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, and I wandered around the Midwest, came back to DC, uh, followed the East Coast Greenway down to Key West and then rode up uh, the, the Gulf Shore uh, over to New Orleans and took the train back to Indianapolis. So I actually moved at the end of that trip and continued living in Indianapolis and started working uh, at uh, Bicycle Garage Indy. So that that trip was tons of fun. Um, when people think about bike camping, you know, there's all different ways you can do it. Um, I on my longer ones, do a mix of all different types of camping, uh, stealth camping or wild camping, where you just tuck into a, a forest, uh, a large park, uh, a, a wooded area, uh, anywhere you can just kind of get away from the road and um, have a quiet place to camp, uh, official campgrounds, be it state parks or RV parks, uh, staying with family and friends or friends of friends. Uh, warmshowers.com is a great resource. It's uh, it's kind of the bike touring version of couch surfing. Uh, and then, you know, Airbnb and hotels are, uh, for me, the more expensive uh, lodging option, but occasionally it's the thing that makes sense if uh, a hurricane is blowing through and I don't have anyone to stay with in an area. Um, I can always get indoors uh, that way. Uh, so when I tour, uh, I kind of plan around 60 miles per day. Everyone sets a different daily uh, average. And, you know, it's plus or minus 20 miles. Uh, so some days I may be going even just 20 miles on a short day, uh, or I may be going, you know, 80 or 90 miles on a long day. Uh, but I kind of plan around a, a base mileage rate uh, and give myself uh, about one day a week to take off. So uh, I took a recent trip uh, where I biked over to Champaign-Urbana and took the train down to New Orleans. Uh, in December and January, I rode from New Orleans to Albuquerque. Uh, the most scenic parts of that were the Big Bend, uh, which is not that easy to get to. Uh, so I made a, a week-long detour down in the Big Bend. Uh, it was beautiful. And then the uh, I'd say the most scenic part of that trip was the Gila Wilderness and the Gila Cave Dwellings. Uh, it was kind of magical to catch that off-season and, and be the only person wandering around the cave dwellings and riding through the mountains with snow on the ground and 
slush still on the on the mountain passes. Um, but that brings me to weather. We've had uh, quite a bit of weather uh, in this uh, past couple of weeks, uh, and folks wonder, you know, what do you do about the weather? Um, right, I'm in a library giving you a presentation. Uh, and it is raining outside, this is what I would often be doing uh, during uh, terrible weather. Uh, it's just ducking into a library, stopping in a coffee shop, uh, kind of reading a book in a picnic shelter, you know, worst case, stopping under a bridge and waiting out severe weather. Um, I wear, when I'm traveling uh, and bike camping, it's it's better to wear layers um, and have quick dry clothing, uh, you know, cotton jeans or a, or a, a a cotton hoodie are not great for bike touring. They'll just stay wet almost, you know, the entire time you're riding uh, for days if you get soaked. Um, and then I sometimes allow for rest days uh, when there's just uh, weather that's unsafe or um, super not fun. Uh, I did that a couple of times on this Southwest tour where, you know, I just didn't want to ride into a driving 40 or 50 mile an hour headwind for the whole day. Um, Having a rain capable tent is important um, and uh, keeping that tent waterproofed. Uh, the, a lot of times that happens overnight and being able to keep your stuff dry is important. And uh, also if you're just planning a short trip, you know, uh, if you don't wanna go out in bad weather, you know, you can always shift the trip, uh, try to have some flexibility or a backup weekend. Uh, if you get a, a, a rain out weekend, you can shift it to a weekend with clearer weather if you're not looking to 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 swim on your bike tour. So uh, just a couple of photos from recent trips. Uh, most of these are from that 2022 trip. Uh, you'll recognize a uh, bike party in the in the left top corner. Uh, I actually spent two weeks in Indianapolis on that 2022 trip just checking out the city and I ended up moving here uh, partly because I had so much fun in the city uh, with bike party, uh, the fringe fest uh, and other other cool stuff uh, going on the two weeks I was here in that August. Uh, bottom left corner is uh, Connecticut going over uh, the, uh, the high point or pass in uh, Northwest uh, Massachusetts. It seemed my first day when I would ride in the Northeast was always the hilliest day until I got out of the, the big stuff and into some river valleys. Um, the middle centers, I have paddle boating in Fort Wayne. I never expected to paddle boat in Fort Wayne or pa paddle board in, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. That's not something I ever knew was an Indiana thing. Um, and the, the far right panel is just an amazing sunset in Northern Michigan, uh, where I tucked into a, a campground along a reservoir and had it to myself on a weeknight, uh, looking out over the reservoir with a wonderful sunset and sunrise. So these are the things that, you know, just come up on a trip uh, and you get uh, a lifetime of memories and stories. Um, you're, you know, bike camping and stealth camping and, and middle of the week camping where you're the only person in an area is just way more uh, relaxing uh, than, than being in a RV park uh, full of generators and barking dogs. Uh, you get some of the best camping you'll ever get. Uh, you get out to areas where stargazing uh, is is beautiful uh, and away from the city lights. Um, you get to eat some of the best diner lunches uh, you'll ever have because you're hungry. Uh, you get to forage, you know, wild cherries along the bike trail, uh, sample all the breweries. Uh, I have a rule not to sample them too early in the day or I'll take a nap and not get where I need to go. Um, you get to interact with uh, folks that are think that their private property is very important um, <laughs> and, and learn which signs are, are good ones to observe. Uh, any sign with a gun or a dog on it, those are the most important signs. Uh, make sure you read those and follow, follow their advice. Um, catching up with local bike culture uh, in the places you're visiting. Uh, seeing how other cities are doing bike lanes, are doing rail trails, uh, are doing traffic calming is something I always love to do on a trip. Uh, experiencing, you know, moon shadows is something I got to do in 2022 in, in a southwest, southeast Ohio uh, valley along the Ohio River. Uh, and it was just so, so calm. Uh, and then just catching arts and theater and uh, 
exploring uh, places where, you know, other people are migrating. Uh, the Cuban boats built out of 55 gallon drums uh, that I saw in the Keys and uh, riding along the, the Texas-Mexico border this last uh, December and January. Um, you get to see folks on the move uh, and, and how industrious people are uh, when they're trying to make their life better. So I just think it's amazing. Uh, you get to swap these stories when you're on trips, especially long ones, if you're staying with somebody that also bike tours, or if you're a host yourself. I'm a warm showers host in Indianapolis, so when bike tours come through, uh, they often stay with me or stay with another warm showers host, and it always includes going out to dinner, uh, having a beer, and sharing stories. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of what I carry, um, but this will be in the PDF uh, that I send out. Um, and, you know, it's, the main thing is you want to keep it light, uh, have the essentials. Uh, and then as long as you're not going into the wilderness, uh, you can always get things you forgot or pick up something if something breaks. Uh, so uh, that's just something to keep in mind and not overpack. Uh, and especially if you're doing any sort of climbing, uh, you'll you'll hate yourself uh, if you bring, you know, five pairs of clothes just to have fresh clothes every day. Uh, when you could have gotten by with, you know, two pairs of clothes and a little bit of sink laundry. Um, so these are things that I bring. Everybody's got their own separate lists. Uh, and my list kind of varies based on weather and time of year and where I'm going. Uh, but I wanted to catch some of it in my notes here that I was sharing. Um, I only carry a little bit of food with me. Uh, some, you know, easy stuff for breakfast and instant coffee. Uh, everybody that bike tours, unless they're allergic, usually has a, a jar of peanut butter um, and something to put it on, some bread or some, uh, some rolls. Uh, and um, definitely have uh, enough ways to carry water uh, and the ways that I can fix my bike. It's nice being a mechanic, but if you're touring, it's good to at least know how to change a flat tire and put your chain back on. Um, there's lots of ways to try bike touring. Um, credit card touring is the lightest weight. You just spend more. So you, you stay at hotels, cabins, and bed and breakfasts, um, just carry a little bit of clothes and, uh, you know, eat at restaurants and stay at hotels. Um, that is lighter weight, quicker, and a little more expensive, right? A lot more expensive. Um, you can do one or two night camping trips, uh, either locally or out from a, a, a starting point. Um, the, my, what I tell people is the longest, uh, the long tour is the biggest challenge really is your first two weeks, one or two weeks. And the challenge is, uh, your comfort on your saddle and your core strength. And, and the way you address both of those is you, you ride, you do some riding before you leave and get some good miles in. Uh, you can also ride with friends or an organized tour group. I mentioned Adventure Cycling Association. And then you can learn from others and read online. There's a Crazy Guy on a Bike is a is a throwback website with forums and discussion groups. Um, you can also ride, find riding friends on, on that website. Uh, or you do day, day rides out of a central campsite. There's all different ways to do this. Um, and if you're looking for a first ride uh, or a one-week ride, I always recommend the Pittsburgh to Cumberland to D.C. on the CNO Trail and the Gap Trail. Um, that's the best ride I've ever done in the U.S., and I'll be doing it again uh, in about a week. So it'll be probably my fifth time riding that route. It's very relaxing. Um, I've got the link down in the bottom. I mentioned Radical Adventure Riders. Um, is a, a really cool group. Uh, I don't know if it's as active in the Midwest, but I know in the Northeast, it was a great, uh, great group for uh, underrepresented um, groups that want to do more gravel riding and bike camping. Um, I've got a couple recommendations for short trips around here. Uh, the White River Campground near Cicero opens in May. Uh, you can ride almost entirely on multi-use trails and rail trails from Indianapolis to that campground. Uh, that's a good one night or two night camp uh, that's easy to get to from here. Uh, I did a 200 mile, approximately 200 mile central Indiana loop with a friend 
last year, and that was that was fun. That's the map that's captured in the corner, and all the swirly spiral slides that you find in all the little towns. I, we stopped at every single one and went down the slide. Um, I've bike camped, uh, you know, in Morgan Monroe State Forest, Brown County State Park. Those are great spots to ride around, uh, especially if you like to ride gravel and dirt um, and quiet, uh, quiet rural roads with some hills. Uh, and then also nearby, the Ohio to Erie Trail from Cincy to Cleveland uh, is a four or five day ride across the state of Ohio that's wonderful. Uh, and I've got a little link in this slide to Quip to, which is a place you can rent bikes and gear. Uh, if you're looking to try something out, but not dive in and, and buy all the stuff for your first bike ride. Uh, safety considerations this is close to the end of my presentation, but I think folks ask this a lot. Your biggest risk is cars and trucks. Um, and it's a lot of that is route choice. Uh, you can either use an established route or follow a rail trail uh, or plan it yourself. Uh, just avoid high speed, high traffic roads, uh, rail trails. Uh, and multi-use trails or routes with wide shoulders are preferred. Uh, and daytime strobe lights, uh, front and rear, are are kind of important uh, when you're on those streets. Uh, I use uh, the water bottle method with dogs, and uh, I don't stealth camp in cities. Only when I'm out um, outside of cities and towns do I stealth camp, unless there's an established camping area. Um, have a good first aid kit. <laughs> know what poison ivy looks like and make sure folks know where you are. And we're gonna save questions till the end. Um, I'll just leave this slide up uh, and uh, drop out here. Feel free to drop questions in the chat too, and I can answer those. Okay, we're going to then turn it over to Damon and talk about your experiences. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I didn't have time to prepare slides, but a lot of what uh, Tony had on his, I would echo. Um, my story is a little bit strange. I sold my business about 10 years ago, and during my uh, work sabbatical, I decided to do a lifelong dream of biking across the country. So I rode from uh, Santa Monica to Washington, D.C., uh, took about six weeks, just right at 3,000 miles. Um, I have been a bike rider forever, but I had not done any kind of multi-day riding other than like the Hilly 100 or the Tosser of Ride. Uh, I had done Rag Ride once a long, long time ago. So it was all new to me, but I was hell-bent on I'm doing this by myself. So I... I Many of the resources that Tony talked about, um, Crazy Guy on a Bike, I love that website. <laughs> it's it's not a pretty thing, but there's lots of good information there. Um, I found out about Warm Showers and I actually started hosting Warm Showers riders here so that I could learn from them the kinds of things I might need to know when I took off on my trip. Um, my biggest concern in leaving was I'm about to spend six weeks on the road by myself. What if I don't like me? <laughs> uh, make it a long and boring thing. Um, luckily, it turns out I, I like myself pretty much. Uh, and it was a magnificent adventure. Uh, I think that, well, it was a big enough change for me that it changed what I do now. Um, I came back from that ride thoroughly convinced that the world would be a better place if more people rode bikes. And, and I've been putting my efforts into trying to get more people doing that, uh, including I am a uh, certified adventure cycling tour leader, and I lead between one and three tours every year for adventure cycling. Um, <clears throat> they offer a variety of tour options. So you can do totally self-contained where you carry everything and you do your own shopping and cooking and sleeping in campgrounds, pitching a tent every night. Uh, I tell people all the time I... I hate sleeping outside, yet I managed to spend two weeks in a tent every year. Um, <clears throat> on my cross-country trip, I did what, uh, 20 o'clock credit card uh, camping. I took all the gear so that I could camp if I needed to, but I left with the intention that I would not camp and pretty much accomplished that. I stayed in warm showers homes. Uh, probably a third of my nights were warm showers homes. 
uh, another small percentage was the homes of people I had met throughout my life. I just you know put out notices on Facebook and LinkedIn and all that saying, this is where I'm going to be. Can you put me up for a night? Um, and then the filled in the gap with uh, what my wife would call dive motels. Because <laughs> when I saw H for hotel, it's like, nah, motels. Um, the route I took followed uh, Route 66 from Santa Monica to St. Louis. And I can't count the number of Route 66 ends I stayed in along that way. Um, so it was great. One of the things, um, talking about trying to avoid weather and getting fed, if you pass a fire station, particularly at mealtime, if you stop, they will more than likely feed you because they fix giant batches of food and feeding one more person doesn't really impact them. Um, and I will say that for that and for almost everyone else you interact with, people will do kind things for you. Accept it with grace. What they want in return, your, your fee for service is your story. They want to hear about it. Where are you going? Where are you been? What are you doing? Um, for weather, I find that I spend a lot of my time being an amateur weatherman. Uh, my my land daily mileage was 65, so I'm right in that same same range. But my during my cross-country ride, that varied from about 20 was my shortest day, and my longest day was 130. And I had, uh, in that six weeks, I had six days that I did a century on my fully loaded bike. But it was avoiding future weather. I can ride two more hours today and let this storm pass through while I'm sleeping, or I can stop now and get up in the morning and ride in the storm. So those kinds of things kind of kind of played into it. Um, advice I would give you is ride along with the locals. The, the local riders will see you with your fully loaded bike and they will want to help you. And sometimes the help is just company for a few miles and maybe some tips on, no, don't take that road, take this road. Um, I was never given bad advice by local riders. And, and my suggestion to people was do what the locals tell you to do. It's gonna work out better because there were several times where I thought this isn't good advice and I stuck with my plan only to discover it really was good advice and I should have taken it. <laughs> um, let's see what else. For me, a part of the adventure was meeting the local people. So the local riders were great. I also tried to eat in uh, local establishments. You know, I didn't do any McDonald's meals, but you know, I on my cross country ride, I looked at if I went through a city that had a restaurant that had ever had ever been on Triple D, the diners. I don't even know what Triple D stands for. <laughs> diners, dives, and drive-ins. I think on the Food Network. Um, I always went to those places because they had something that was good to eat. And I would always ask for, bring me whatever guy ate. I don't need to see a menu. Uh, it <laughs> made for some great meals and some great conversation. Um, test out your gear. I <laughs> I did a, a shakedown ride before my cross country ride. I rode around Lake Michigan to see if I had the right gear and if it worked like it was supposed to and all that. And I had tested out everything individually, except for at the last minute, I decided I needed a new Garmin bike computer. And it literally arrived in the mail the day before I left. So I'm out on the road on the first day and uh, I have no idea how to work this thing. And so <laughs> I spent a good half hour, 45 minutes sitting on the side of the road, playing with buttons to try to figure out how to make this thing work. Cause of course I didn't bring the instructions with me. Um, so check out all your gear, make sure it works. Um, as I have led many tours, uh, the longest tour I've led was a West Coast tour. We rode from the Canadian border to the Mexican border along the California, Oregon, Washington coast. That was a six week tour. Um, very challenging to be in charge of adults for that long, um, but it was, it was a fun ride. But I learned from that, everyone who 
takes off on a ride like this is taking off on an adventure. But your adventure is the important part of that ride. And what I've seen many touring riders do is get caught up in somebody else's adventure and they don't have as great a time. So even if you don't know what your adventure is, it'll come to you as you ride and stick with it. <clears throat> and the other thing is I like to do themes. So like I've had rides where for two weeks, I, I look for donut shops in every town. I'm looking for the best donut along this route. It's, and if you're riding 65 miles a day, you can eat a lot of donuts and it, it'll be okay. Um, I got into a kick during my cross country ride of uh, finding the world's largest thing. And so I, I have a whole photo collection of the world's largest stuff, rocking chairs and potatoes and pumpkins and paper clips and uh, the world's largest crayon at the Crayola factory. So uh, they don't make a lot of sense, but they, they help to pass the time and they give you something to kind of be on the lookout for. Um, <clears throat> what I'll add about campgrounds, very often, if you are riding alone, you can go into a campground and find a camper who will let you share their campsite um, and will probably feed you and maybe even let you have a beer. So uh, it's uh, it's when you're on a loaded bike, you get a lot of kindness and and take advantage of it. Uh, let's see what else did I have here. Oh, the, the last thing, um, and Tony hinted at it earlier, a credit card doesn't weigh much. If you're, if you're going to do tours here in the United States, if you forgot something, you can probably find it along the way. Um, and there are lots of thrift stores and Goodwills, and you can pick up something. Like uh, I was told as I was planning my cross-country ride, don't carry cold weather gear for the three days you're going to be at altitude. Find a Goodwill before you go into the mountains. And when you come out of the mountains, give it to a Goodwill on the other side so you don't have to haul that stuff forever. Um, but the, the bicycle touring community is large, it's varied, and it's extremely friendly. So uh, don't be afraid to get out there and try it. That's all I got. Awesome. Thank you. We have some questions. Um, some of them have been answered in the chat, but I want to um, give both presenters an opportunity um, to answer. So how do you manage the logistics of getting your bike to and from your starting and final destinations? I can, I'll give my answer and then I think Damon will probably have other, other ones. Um, I, I really like local tours. So those are the easiest ones. I just ride straight out from here uh, and, and head out for a night or two or three or a week. Uh, and then I don't have to worry about transport. So that's the easiest way to handle it. Um, uh, other trips, I've uh, uh, taken an Amtrak uh, and a lot of their cross country, almost all their cross country ones have a baggage car and you can roll your bike right up the platform, take your bags off, hand it to the baggage car, take your bags in with you. Um, so I do that. Um, unfortunately, the Cardinal route through Indianapolis only runs three days a week. So that's a, that's a little constricting, but if you're doing a longer tour, it's, it's not that bad because uh, your schedule is often pretty flexible if you're doing something really long. Um, I biked over to Champaign-Urbana and caught the city of New Orleans south uh, to New Orleans to start a Southern tour, uh, similarly uh, with the bike. Um, and then I've caught rides when a group of people or my uh, dad wanted to ride with me on the Katy Trail last year. Uh, he just drove over in his pickup truck. We threw both our bikes in the back and car pulled over to the start. Uh, so you can always ship a bike, like bike shop to bike shop, and they'll box it uh, and and build it. Uh, and the bike will be there and ready ready for you. Uh, at the shop uh, near your starting point. Uh, we do that for customers at PGI all the time. But Damon, you've probably done some different ways of getting around to starts and getting back from finished rides. I have tried a lot of those things. Um, in Lean Tour for Adventure Cycling, I, I may be starting from anywhere. And so if I'm starting from Utah uh, and I got to get there and have enough time. Uh, so I have taken my bike on planes. Uh, and nowadays, 
almost all the airlines will consider your bike just uh, an extra piece of luggage. For a while, you try to take your bike on a plane and they charge you 200 bucks for the bike. And so it made no sense. Uh, but now it's just that extra luggage charge of 50 bucks or whatever it is, uh, or an overweight charge depending on how heavy your bike is. So you can take your bike on a plane, but again, you've got to get it packed up. And the smart thing to do if you're going to take your bike on a plane is to either buy or rent a bike carrier as opposed to putting it in a bike box. And if I'd had time, I could have told you the place that you can rent those from where they'll ship it to you, give you return shipping so you can pack your bike up because they're they're rather expensive if you're not going to use them a lot. It's not worth buying one. Um, I have loaded my bike on, on the car and driven to places. Uh, I led a tour of the Katy Trail. Uh, I also took my wife on a tour to Katy Trail, which was the most luxurious bicycle tour one could ever have because I wanted her to enjoy it and I, she did. Uh, so hopefully we'll get to do some more. Um, but when I did the Katy Trail ride, I just put my bike in the car and drove over. Um, there are, you can also take your bus, take your bike on the bus. Uh, Greyhound will let you put your bike under the bus as luggage. Uh, they don't charge extra, but you do have to have it boxed up. And, and I agree, if you're gonna box your bike up, I recommend that you take it to a local shop, have them box it up, and then contact a shop where you're gonna start riding from, ship your bike to them and have them put it back together. It's, you don't want to start the ride with a, I wonder if I tightened that right, or I wonder if I adjusted that correctly. Uh, let a professional do it for you. So you you got one less thing to worry about when you start riding. Um, REI is a, a good resource for that because they have locations all over the country. And REI will ship via their internal shipping process, your bike from one REI store to another. Um, and I've done that before and it worked out okay. Um, I've also taken my bike, like I said, I've taken it on a plane and I literally have sat in the airport and put my bike back together and then pedaled away from the airport. I'll tell you, TSA doesn't like that too much. <laughs> yeah, I've done the, done the same at uh, Greyhound stations. Yeah. Yeah. So there are lots of ways to, to get your bike there. And there's also the option of renting a bike. If you're going to go somewhere and you're going to do a, a loop tour where you come back to the same spot, you can rent a bike uh, from a local shop. Just make sure you reach out to shops in advance and tell them what you're doing and that they actually have the right bicycle for you. Um, and I've, I've had tour riders who rented bikes for the tours. And for the most part, they had success. I did have one rider who showed up on a bike that he shouldn't have been riding for this long tour, but that's what the shop he rented from told him he should use. Um, so there are lots of options for getting your bike around. I'd like to have my own bike. I don't like to, to use a bike I've not ridden before. So I always take mine with me. All right. So we've got another question is, Budgeting will vary and availability of credit cards is valuable and ATMs, but anything else to consider when pre-planning from a financial impact and insurance? Hmm. Well, I was trying to make sure I was carrying um, some cash because sometimes you get to small places where cash is king. Um, and I carried a credit card. Um, and you kind of, it really is, you have to think about there's a trade-off between budget and comfort. And so you have to think about where do you want to be on that spectrum? Uh, I, I have ridden with folks who are touring on $8 a day. Um, and I think I can't eat breakfast for $8 a day, <laughs> but it, it is possible to, to tour for really, really next to nothing. Uh, and I have been with people who are staying in Hilton's every night and are spending hundreds of dollars a day. So as a part of your planning, think about what do you want to spend or take the approach of doing a, an organized tour for your first outing where they'll tell you up front, the tour costs this much money and here's what's included and off you go. Yeah, I'm going to second uh, carry some cash uh, and I usually keep a, a, a back stock, you know, a couple hundred bucks uh, tucked away somewhere in my bike. Uh, 
that's my uh, emergency fund uh, in case you know credit card gets lost uh, or the ATM's not functioning in town and I need to get into a hotel room or something. Um, and uh, the you know there's uh, I, I the mention mentioning of insurance came up in that question um, and that on very long tours uh, I found you know uh, as a budget conscious tourist uh, that that was my biggest uh, cost uh, aside from food and lodging. So um, uh, the, if you're able to uh, carry your insurance from a, a prior employer or time your trip to whatever vacation you've got, uh, mm -hmm. not having to pay for insurance is, is a helpful thing for budget. Um, and uh, international bike touring is cheaper, yes. uh, hands down. Yes. Uh, everybody I've talked to that's done uh, and I've done a little bit myself. Uh, food and lodging in the U.S. is is really expensive. Uh, and there's no hostels, barely any hostels, and the hostels here cost as much as much as a hotel. Absolutely. So if you're internationally or European touring or touring, you know, uh, in Asia, uh, there, the the bike tourists I know that do that kind of stuff are are you know get feel very comfortable riding on or planning for twenty bucks a day. Uh, for their food and lodging uh, costs. It uh, doesn't work in the U.S. Uh, their budget gets ruined as soon as they hit the U.S. Um, Maybe I they had a tourist could... that wanted to, he, he was going to turn turn right and go to Mexico because he just couldn't afford <laughs> to keep yeah, Even in the U.S. you can do it, but you, you uh, let's say it'll be a sketchy ride at times. <laughs> yeah, they, a, uh, they were on, they were on like in the U.S., they were on like beans and rice uh, kind of diet because they just couldn't do restaurants and they're yeah. uh, in Texas they were having trouble because you know all the barbed wire and no public land so they couldn't stealth camp that's the U.S. is a bit tougher to do on on that really thin budget yeah I think that's all the questions we got in the chat does anybody else have any additional questions Feel free to unmute yourself and ask them. If not, and it's uh, the long tours are 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 a big uh, um, big thing to chunk off, but don't feel nervous about going out for a day. You know, one day out camp and come back. You know that that is bike bike camp riding, and it's it's just as fun, and you can sneak it into a, a weekend or a long weekend. Um. Yeah, so we have a couple questions. Uh, what is stealth camping, and do you have a target weight for your bike and gear? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, stealth camping. Uh, uh, do you want to do that one, Damon, and I'll do you my target weight? And stealth you camping is when you're camping someplace that's not official for you to camp in. Um, I met a guy who had been on the road, literally had been on the road for six years. He and his wife and their dog, and they camped under billboards along the side of the road and you know that kind of stuff uh, i talked to a guy who on his cross-country ride he slept in the little um, demo barns that they set up outside of lowe's and home depots for people who want to buy shit for their yard he would just wait until the store closed and then go climb into one of those and sleep for the night that's stealth camping You know, my there there are some folks that that will stealth camp anywhere. Uh, generally, I I do it a lot, uh, and I do it in ways that aren't visible. So as soon as I've got uh, leaves on trees, I can go two hundred feet into the woods, and and uh, you know, as long as there's not a sign with a gun or a dog on it, um, I'm I'm pretty comfortable chilling out. Uh, and you just don't start a fire. You don't do things to draw attention to yourself uh, unless you're in a, a place where that's uh, you know something you know you can do. Uh, and it's just a low cost way to, to camp and it takes less planning too. Uh, you can just tuck in anywhere when you're close to the end of your day, you start looking for a spot. Uh, so that's stealth camping. Um, having a small tent uh, or, a, or a hammock uh, with a rain flag uh, helps because uh, you want to have a small footprint to fit pretty much anywhere. 
um, target weight. Um, I try to keep my bike in gear uh, under 70, 75 pounds loaded. Um, a lot of long range tourists are when they're fully loaded or closer to 100 pounds. Um, but that's more than I like. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I uh, I talked to a guy as I was planning my cross country ride who had done several trips back and forth across the country. And uh, he said, when it comes to gear, if you can't fit in 20 pounds, don't take it with you. Uh, and everybody else had been telling me I was going to have at least 50 pounds of gear along with my, you know, 30, 40 pound bike. And I thought that just seems so heavy. Um, and when I left here on my trip around Lake Michigan, I left home with 50 pounds of gear. And uh, I stayed with friends and family at different points along the way and kept leaving things behind. And lo and behold, when I got home, I had 20 pounds of gear. So you can fit it in 20 pounds. And this doesn't matter what does your bike weigh. Um, you know, once you get racks and and wider tires and all that on there, uh, you're not going to have a 22-pound a bike. Um, so you should expect that, you know, that 75 is probably, if you get under 75, you've done something kind of miraculous. Uh, which also means make sure you have a great big granny gear because to haul that 75-pound bike up a big hill, you're, you're going to want it. <laughs> Yeah, and the uh, uh, you you often will add weight at the end of the day if you're headed out to camp, especially if it's not an established camp. You'll fill up a you know I'll fill up a two liter water bag and I'll you know, get food at the end of the day uh, mm -hmm. for that evening and for the next morning. Um, so mm -hmm. that you know you'll you'll add weight from time to time, but you don't want to be carrying it all the time. And uh, I see a comment there that, about bike and barge, where it's another way to do bike camping, right? And bike touring, uh, where your your camp is the barge, um, and you're just doing day rides out at uh, destination cities. I've I've had friends do that as well. I've heard it's super fun. There are a lot of um, tour companies around the country and around the, around the globe. So if if you're uncomfortable with doing it on your own, it's easy to find a tour company that will take you along. And uh, the accommodations vary and so does the price. So you might have to look at a few. Uh, if you get a copy of Adventure Cycling Magazine, there's a huge section in the back with advertisements for a lot of those companies. Um, or you find somebody like us and say, hey, we wanna go on a tour. I'd be happy to help somebody figure out a route and plot out a tour and maybe even ride a day or two with you. Yeah. And as soon as the, uh, uh, white river campground opens up, I'm planning on doing a, uh, uh, you know, leave a Sunday, come back a Monday on my break. So anybody that wants a super easy, short one, um, happy to split a campsite. There you go. Yeah. We have another question when considering the number of days, what's the break point on where you wouldn't carry a camp stove? I didn't used to carry a camp stove at all. Uh, and I just did, you know, granola, uh, you know, peanut butter, jelly sandwiches. Uh, I didn't carry a stove. Uh, recent long trips, I've gotten a little addicted to caffeine. Uh, so I carry some instant coffee and a, a jet boil, which is a very lightweight stove. Um, I mean, I, and, and it's not really a distance thing. It's, it's, do you want to handle, do you want to carry the weight? Uh, and is our, is hot food important to you for, you know, comfort, um, and, and diet. So I, I have friends that'll go out for one night and they'll take, you know, a coffee grinder and a French press, uh, and because they just, that's what they think is important, um, <laughs> along with their stove. Yeah. And I, I typically, if I'm going solo, I don't take a stove, um, because a part of the adventure for me is always meeting the local people. And there's no better place to meet the local people than in a restaurant. So, you know, I, I don't eat expensive meals, but I, I tend to eat most of my meals in restaurants. Um, but they're, in, you know, restaurant is a 
maybe fancier term for the places I eat in than than it would imply because food trucks are a great place for me to stop. Um, so I don't, and, and I have even purchased food that needed to be cooked and show up at a campground where I bake my way onto somebody's campsite by saying, hey, I brought some food. I'm going to cook it if you'll help me eat it. Uh, <clears throat> so there there are ways to get around carrying a stove. And I, I agree. I just, I try to avoid the weight. And I see the next question for nutrition, uh, ever not have enough calories. <laughs> um, I mean, that's what that jar of peanut butter is for. Um, I always have some backup, you know, calories and salt in my food bag. Uh, and everything tastes good when you're hungry. Uh, <laughs> but I've, I've not had that problem. I mean, I, I do plan ahead and have some back backup stuff. Uh, so I've got a, you know, a day worth of a day or two worth of, you know, food if I need it. Uh, but it's usually pretty basic. Uh, and, and energy and energy and calorie dense uh, and often salty. Yeah. Yeah. My worst night was I stayed with a warm showers host who was supposed to feed me and didn't. Uh, so I dug through my bags and as it turned out for the couple of days prior, I had been stopping at convenience stores and I would stop at a convenience store to use the bathroom, but I always buy something. So I'm paying for the bathroom use. <laughs> And they were doing uh, candy bars, two for one. And I would always ask, can I get one for half the price? And they would be like, no, one costs a dollar and two costs a dollar. So I had like three candy bars in my bag from having tossed those extras in there. So I had Snicker bars and goldfish for dinner that night. But, you know, it was calories and it got me on the road the next day. So, but yeah, uh, that's right. It's, when you're riding that much, a lot of things that you wouldn't normally eat become very edible. I'm I'm really into like anchovies uh, and and tuna, the things I don't eat in my daily life when I'm biking. <laughs> uh, the the ever had somebody try to steal your bike and gear? Um, I mean, as somebody who rides in a city, uh, I mean I'm I'm just kind of careful. Uh, so I have a, a small U lock and a very light cable lock that I use. Um, and some towns you just know that your bike's not going to go anywhere. Like if you pull into an Amish like hardware store, uh, you can just lean your bike against the building uh, next to the cart and the horses and go in and get whatever you need. But um, anywhere I have any sort of nervousness, I lock the bike. Um, and if it's in a city, I try to, you know, I have my bags on the bike. I keep my eye on it. So I'm going to be at the the seat in the restaurant facing the window. Um so I've not had that trouble, but I'm also pretty careful. Uh, I've had friends that have been in bigger cities and and folks have pulled the or lead bags off and they had to walk down the street, hand people 20s until they gathered it all back up from the, the local folks who had stripped it off the bike. But I've been lucky. Uh, it's, it's not as common, uh, but definitely, you know, lock your bike and keep an eye on your gear. Um, you know, use use good practice like you would like you're riding your bike in a city. Yeah, it is. Um, if your bike is loaded, it's less appealing to somebody to want to steal it, but they might pick at your stuff. I've never had any trouble uh, on any of my tours, and I rarely lock my bike when I'm on tour. I take a lock with me because there are there's some cities where if you turn your back on your bike, it's gone. You know, DC is one of those. Uh, you can't get off your bike in DC and blink if it's not locked. <laughs> Um, but in most of America, nobody wants your big heavy bike that's got all that crap on it. So it's fairly safe, but you do need to, it, it's, it's your whole world when you're on tour. So you, you got to make sure you're taking care of it. And, uh, I make sure my bike's good and ugly. It's covered with stickers. <laughs> yep. All right, I think we're coming close to the end here. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Damon and Anthony, for all of your great information and for the great questions from the people who attended. Um, like 
uh, Tony said, I will put the presentation, a link to the presentation up on the Lunch and Learn website so you can find it there, um, as well as on the YouTube description when it gets posted. So um, hope everybody has a great rest of the day and this weekend and next week look awesome for biking. So hopefully everyone can get out there and um, have a great weekend. Thanks. You bet. Thanks everybody. Thank yep. you. And I just threw my uh, email in the chat there as did uh, Damon. And uh, if you ever want to chat at uh, VGI downtown, I'm at that shop most days. Great. See everybody. Thanks. Yeah. Bye.